members. It is time for questions to the Minister for Infrastructure, and we will start with listed questions. However, first of all, just to inform members, questions 8, 9 and 11 have been withdrawn. I call Gordon Dunn. Question 1, please, Mr Deputy Speaker. The A2 Belfast to Bangor Road is part of the strategic road network and carries around 45,000 vehicles per day. My department has long-term plans to improve a number of the junctions along this route to improve road safety. A route study was carried out on the A2 in 2011 and a number of junction improvements were identified. Two particular schemes at the A2 Ballyrobert Road and the A2 Ballymoney Road have been taken forward to detailed design. Progression of these schemes will, however, be subject to satisfactory completion of the statutory processes, and the availability of funding in future years, and prioritisation. My department has also a proposal in a strategic road improvement programme to upgrade the Sydenham bypass between D Street and Tillysburn from a dual two-lane carriageway to a dual three-lane carriageway. This is now at the third stage of a three-stage development process. At this time, the Executive has identified a number of flagship projects where indicative funding has been agreed for future budget periods. Unfortunately, the Sydenham bypass upgrade widening is not one of those projects, and its progression is dependent on the availability of finance through future budgetary settlements. Paul Gordon Dunn for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his detailed answer indeed today. As the Minister has mentioned, it is an extremely busy road with 45,000 users going through sections of the road over a 24-hour period. And sadly, this year we've had two fatalities already on that section of road. Does the Minister recognise that we have also two other very dangerous junctions, namely at Kearney Hill on the Devil's Elbow? and Large Hill, where residents take lives in their hands as they leave and enter their homes on a daily basis, and what plans has he in place to try and address those issues? Thank you. I thank the member for his question, indeed his interest uh, in road safety. Uh, whilst I don't have the specific information at hand uh, around the two, two junctions, let the member uh, be aware, and certainly if I can put him at ease, that road safety is a priority for myself and my department. Uh, we constantly keep under review road safety on all of our roads. The A2 is a busy road, I've said 45,000 vehicles per day. Uh, so if there's issues of this that the member wants to correspond with me on, please feel free to do so. I call Alan Chambers. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I certainly uh, welcome uh, the news that the Minister has given us that there are plans to improve some of the junctions on this busy road. Uh, disappointed to hear the news about the Sydney bypass because I think that would have made a big uh, contribution to traffic progression. But my question is, does the minister have any plans to provide any more physical um, central uh, traffic separation uh, to prevent crossover collisions? That, uh, given the speed and the, the sheer volume of the traffic in this road, uh, certainly can prove fatal. Thank you. I thank the member. And indeed, there, you know, if you look at the, the A1 uh, and the, the very unfortunate situations uh, of the fatalities, and I know members in the House will be well aware of the urgent need to upgrade the likes of the A1, and we do have a £50 million uh, safety plan in place over the next number of years to address that. Um, and whilst the, the A2 maybe doesn't receive the same amount of attention with regards uh, to, to, to previous fatalities, as I say, it is, it is an issue that is on the horizon all the time. We keep on the review road safely on all of our major roads, uh, but there are no plans currently to look at this. Um, you, you made reference to this, the Sydney Bypass. Uh, these upgrades would be in the region of 40 to 50 million pounds, so it would be a significant investment. And certainly, as I go forward looking at different capital projects, this is something I have to bear in mind. Call Stephen Farry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I uh, first of all add to the, the list that my colleague very wisely mentioned, um, Gordon Dunn, the, the junction, uh, the turn off into the Kinnegar area in, in Hollywood, which is also a very dangerous uh, junction. I would also ask the Minister, would he be, be prepared to consider uh, the long term future of the Rathgill Road in Bangor, which is a feeder on to the A2 dual carriageway, which is an extremely busy road, which is technically a rural road, but has seen massive housing developments in recent years and indeed is a feeder for the, the outer edge of Bangor onto that road in terms of how we can better manage the, the traffic in that area? 
the, the member has uh, made reference to the, the Kinniger Road. Um, changes were made recently to the signal timings for the PM uh, peak between Redburn Square and Esplanade to allow easier egress from Redburn Square turning right towards Bangor. With regards to the specific question on the Rathgale Road, I don't currently have any plans uh, to look at what the member is asking, but again, as I've said to uh, Mr Chambers, if the member wishes to correspond with me on this, uh, and perhaps we could look at options for the time ahead. I call Sidney Anderson for a question. Okay, yeah, question two. In 2014, the Strategic Investment Board carried out a review of street lighting and I recommended that my department implement a pilot project to retrofit sodium street lighting units with LED replacements in response to the ongoing street lighting resource pressures to achieve energy and maintenance savings. It was agreed that the Craigavon and Banbridge areas would be used as a representative pilot. The completion of the LED pilot has seen the replacement of over 15,000 sodium street lighting units with new low energy, long life LEDs that produce good quality white light. It is estimated that the LED pilot will provide annual savings of around £360,000 in electricity, carbon and maintenance costs for an investment of around £3 million. The pilot also allowed my department to gain direct experience of how it can best deliver the necessary surveys, design specification of LED equipment, procurement of the equipment, and to assess the LED technology in a wide range of residential scenarios. I do acknowledge that there have been some concerns raised by residents, elected representatives, and councils about the loss of generalized lighting to the fronts of houses, gardens, pathways, front doors. However, it is the department's responsibility to light adapted roads and footways only. In all, I think it has been a worthwhile pilot which has delivered on its aims to provide savings and a better understanding of LED street lighting. I call Sidney Anderson for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for, for that answer. But Minister, I'm sure you're well aware uh, that this so-called pilot scheme was rolled out across Craig and uh, Barnbridge with little or no consultation. And I'm also uh, sure that you're aware that there have been many complaints regarding the level of lighting now in place. Can I ask you, Minister, and I know what, uh, adjustments have been made in certain places, but are you satisfied? And I know you haven't uh, uh, said there that maybe uh, this is a good scheme, but are you really satisfied that this lighting scheme, as it presently exists, is acceptable and is something that you intend to roll out right across Northern Ireland? Well, certainly uh, I want to take greater stock of the assessment of the, the pilot before we would ever consider rolling it out right across uh, the north. You've alluded to the complaints. Uh, as of the 26th of October, uh, there were 268 complaints. These were typically in relation to reduced lighting levels and the level of spilt light into residential gardens. Um, all complaints received are individually recorded and assessed with lighting levels checked against the required standards. Uh, and following the assessment of the lighting levels at each of the site, 199 were within the appropriate levels uh, that the department is aiming to provide and 69 were indeed adjusted uh, to come up to this level. Iram, uh, sir, Sinead Bradley for your cash. I call Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question three, please. The executive's programme for government is focused on outcomes that will support a prosperous economic future for all of the people of the North. The executive has already committed to delivery of four flagship infrastructure projects which are the A5 and A6 major road schemes, the Belfast Transport Hub, the Belfast Rapid Transit Programme. I have been clear that my top priority is redressing the infrastructure deficit, particularly in the West. Projects like the A5 and the A6 are critical to addressing that historic imbalance. Regarding the latter, I was delighted to recently announce the £160 million investment in the Randallstown to Castle Dawson phase of the A6 making a difference for 18,000 commuters daily. An advanced work has now begun, and I will be monitoring the progress of the project very closely indeed. I am also very keen to promote active travel, and I will shortly publish a strategic plan for greenways, which will set out an ambitious 25-year plan to develop a greenway network right across the north. My plan will aim to give people ready access to a safe, traffic-free environment for health, active travel, and leisure. I want to see significant investments in greenways during the current mandate of the Assembly. Developing this greenway network will contribute to several programme for government outcomes through delivering active travel infrastructure, 
reducing congestion, improving air quality, and providing a safe and accessible recreational resource for more healthy, active lifestyles. Finally, progressing north-south projects such as the Narrowater Bridge and the Ulster Canal will be a key priority in the years ahead, as set out by the Fresh Start Agreement. Following the recent North-South Ministerial Council plenary held in July, officials North and South have been engaging with stakeholders associated with both projects in advancing construction and sourcing suitable funding sources going forward. I myself have also met with the Narrowater Bridge campaigners in Warren Point during the summer, and very recently I co-chaired the newly established Ulster Canal Advisory Forum with Minister Heather Humphreys. Sinead Bradley for a supplementary. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, the Minister, thank you for your answer, and you very astutely referred to the Narrowater Bridge, which I'm sure you preempted would, would be my supplementary. Um, and you talk about the years ahead, Minister. Could you, could you give a clear answer? Do you see Narrow Water Bridge being delivered during this mandate? I thank the member for her supplementary and certainly our compliment about being astute. Uh, and with that in mind, let me continue to be astute. Uh, I certainly will endeavour uh, to do all that I can to ensure that projects such as the Narrow Water Bridge project and indeed the Ulster Canal and the A5, uh, as outlined in the Fresh Start Agreement, mm -hmm. Uh, progress as all of us do wish. I call Jenny Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister reassure the House that the York Street interchange, which will dramatically improve the flow of traffic in Greater Belfast for commuters and commercial traffic from across Northern Ireland, will not be sacrificed in order to secure funding for other projects likely to have a smaller impact on traffic numbers? I thank the member for her question, uh, and indeed I, I can uh, confirm that none of these projects will be sacrificed so that other smaller uh, priority projects, as, as you've outlined, uh, can go ahead. Uh, there's no doubt that the recent Euro Euro European referendum result has cast doubt and fresh challenges and hurdles that the department would rather not have had to face, uh, and that is something that I have to take stock of uh, when I look at my priorities going forward. George Robinson. Hey, Mr. <clears throat> um, will the Minister state if he will consider the duelling of the A37 Coleraine to London Derry or Corby's Corridor, including the Greystone Road, Broad Road A37 Junction Roundabout Scheme, as a pr priority to aid attracting inward investment to the northwest and of the province and help road safety? I, I'm more than happy to consider any project uh, if it's going to advance some of the uh, advantages that you've outlined about opening up the northwest to tourism uh, and economic growth. But the particular carriageway that you have mentioned, I have no plans to progress any dueling schemes. I call Fra McCann. I'll ask Con Cullia, and uh, the, the, the Minister has partially uh, answered my question, and I welcome his commitment uh, to the cross-border. Uh, projects, but is there any additional projects besides the ones he has laid out uh, that would be prioritised uh, uh, before the end of this mandate? Yes, certainly. Uh, and I've made reference to the, the Greenway project and uh, the strategy outlined. You know, a large extent of this Greenway will also be connected into existing Greenways uh, in, in, in neighbouring counties of Donegal and in Monaghan and, and Cavan and, and Louth in, in our own particular part of the world. Uh, around the Carlingford Lock. Um, the Ulster Canal, the A5 and Narrow Water, of course, are outlined in the Fresh Start Agreement. But we also have, I think, great opportunity to be expanding upon our rail opportunity, to, to be looking at the, the Derry to Dublin uh, rail infrastructure uh, and looking wherever we can possible uh, to join up. Uh, I think the great work of our local ports as well. There's a great relationship there between our ports uh, and whatever. This is something that we will look to enhance in the years ahead. Call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what independent advice he's received in the, developing his list of priorities? I thank the member for her, her question. Uh, I, I receive lots of advice day and daily. Uh, I suppose it's one of the drawbacks of having a social media account uh, that lots of experts are telling you day and daily what you should be doing uh, and what particular projects uh, deserve more money than others. Um, but it's something that we take on board. My department is stacked with officials who are experts in their field, be it from greenways to developing rail and road infrastructure. Uh, so I listen to advice uh, day and daily. 
uh, and none more so, I suppose, in setting out my priorities of addressing the infrastructure deficit west of the ban. You only have to talk to members in the House who maybe travel daily from the west uh, into places like Belfast, and you'll see the real need to be able to move forward in a very balanced way. I call Alex Easton for a question. Question number four, Mr. Deputy Speaker. My department undertakes an annual program of carriageway reconstruction and resurfacing works commensurate with the availability of financial resources. Article 8 of the Roads Order 1993 places a duty on my department to maintain all public roads and footways in a safe and serviceable condition. To this end, Transport NI operates a system of regular safety inspections to ensure that essential response maintenance is identified and completed as necessary. In accordance with this policy document, Roads Maintenance Standards for Safety, Transport NI inspects the condition of public roads. The information collected, along with consideration of a number of other factors, including road usage, general surface condition, structural deformation, public inquiries and public liability claims, is used in the preparation and prioritisation of Transport NI's annual reconstruction and resurfacing programme. These programmes are subsequently presented by Transport NI to the various district councils at their spring and autumn meetings. I am pleased to say that additional capital funding was prioritised by the Executive for structural maintenance as part of the June monitoring round. I listened to concerns about the deterioration in rural roads and I announced a £10 million package for rural roads initiatives to target maintenance measures at around 1,000 locations on our rural road network. Work on these schemes is now well underway. I can assure the member that I will continue to discuss with executive colleagues the requirement for additional baseline funding for structural maintenance as part of the next capital budget. Alex Easton for supplementary. Thank you. Um, can I thank the Minister for his answer so far? Can the Minister explain why my own constituency is getting the least amount of capital structural maintenance expenditure spent on it and the likes of Beachfield Drive and William Street and Donaghy, which are well over 40 years and falling apart, are being ignored? Thank you. Well, Transport NI, the department and myself obviously have to prioritise on the basis of need. Um, w when you break down areas into a list, there's always going to be a, a particular part of the world is going to be bottom of the list. There's always going to be a particular part of the world is going to be top of the list. Uh, so on, on, with that in mind, uh, I, I don't want to suggest that your constituency by any way of sorts uh, is losing out. It is a reflection of need. As, as I've laid out, there are a number of criteria that, that is set for divisional managers and the teams to assess this. Uh, so be under no illusions, um, there is no sleight of hand. Uh, I have no doubt that your constituency is well represented um, by active assembly members. And as I say, as the department looks at need, I have no doubt that the constituency will receive money on an equal basis. The Minister made reference to his rural roads initiative, which has been very welcome, no, none more so than in the Western Division. Would he be in a position to give us um, an update as to how that is progressing? <coughs> yeah, following June monitoring, uh, the Department embarked on a £10 million rural road initiative to address the rural roads in the worst condition, therefore helping to reduce a backlog of rural road resurfacing and repair needs. Uh, it is estimated that around 1,000 locations on the rural road network will be improved. The funding was allocated to the four transport NI divisions on the basis of need, using a range of weighted indicators. Northern Division got 2 million, Southern Division 3.5 million, Eastern Division got 500,000, and Western Division 4 million. Work is well underway, with around 350 locations receiving intervention thus far. Aram Sir, Mark Durkin. Uh, I would ask John Corlea and thank the Minister for his answers thus far. I would also uh, congratulate him on the work that has been done uh, around uh, roads maintenance. Although sometimes I wonder if Transport and I fix the potholes or just move them around so you can't memorise them. I just uh, wonder if the Minister would have maybe a ballpark uh, figure in terms of the cost to the Department uh, of or through claims. Uh, due to damage caused to, to vehicles due to poorly maintained roads? I thank the member and uh, again let, let him rest assured that the department are not moving potholes about. Uh, unfortunately, there is a backlog, a quite considerable backlog, when we look at roads maintenance uh, and an awful lot of roads, especially in rural areas. 
um, certainly require maintenance and is something I will prioritise over the years ahead. Uh, I don't have the specific figures in front of me when it comes to claims. This is an issue that has been in the press uh, over recent months uh, and is certainly something I'll be keeping a focus of in the time ahead. I call Gordon Lyons for a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number five. Following consultation in 2015, the former Department of the Environment introduced new regulations which increased the technical road speed limit of agricultural tractors from 20 mile an hour to 24.8 mile an hour. These regulations come into force on 18 April 2016. The consultation was well supported and the increase in speed limit took account of the design capabilities of modern tractors. The new regulations align the speed limit for agricultural tractors in the north with the rest of Europe and ensure that farmers here are not disadvantaged. Although the consultation documents suggest that further increases in tractor speeds were being considered, I currently have no plans to further increase construction road speeds for agricultural tractors. Gordon Lyons for a supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for his answer, and I'm pleased to hear that that ha has now changed. However, I would ask that the Minister would keep that under review. Obviously, um, a lot of the tractors on the roads nowadays are capable um, of going uh, at higher speeds uh, in a very safe uh, manner. Further to the uh, answer that the Minister has given to me, um, has he any update on the weight uh, limits um, for uh, tractors and agricultural vehicles? Thank you, and indeed, again, for a number of pieces of legislation, we will keep it under constant review, as certainly as technology advances as well, it would be only right to do so. Um, and I, I will have to correspond with the member. I don't have that information ahead of it to wait. Call Jerry Mullen. Speaker, uh, the previous speaker I just asked the right question I was going to, so thank you. Here, sir, Barry, Barry McIldoff. I call Barry McIldoff. Well, but uh, I think the Minister did indicate that the speed limit was 20 miles per hour, just to seek a clarification on that. And secondly, there's a practice in the country where tractors very often cause tailbacks. Yeah. I'm all for the farmer, of course I am. But at the same time, you know, wonder is there a convention or a law in place uh, detailing or restricting the number of vehicles uh, behind the tractor? Is it eight? Is it nine or is it ten? Where a tractor might be expected to pull in and give way to the ensuing traffic? It's a very important issue. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, thank, I thank the member for, for the question. Uh, indeed, I, I can clarify uh, that the, the, the previous uh, legislation was 20 mile an hour uh, for the member. Um, I'm not aware of any specific piece of legislation that would detail the, the number of vehicles that uh, build up behind for the tractor to pull in. But in my experience, coming from a rural constituency, uh, our farmers are very much part of the community. They, they don't want to be the cause of long tailbacks, and very often they, they do find a suitable place to pull in. Uh, and long may that tradition continue. Well, Rosemary Barton for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question six. Uh, the A32 OMA the Inniskill and Improvement Strategy includes a number of improvement schemes to enhance the transport links between the towns and improve access to the new acute hospital in Inniskillen. The main focus is to upgrade the worst sections of the route to improve comfort for ambulance services and to reduce journey times. Schemes at Shanara and Drumniskinny have been completed at a combined cost of approximately 10 million, and two further schemes are currently being developed at Cornamuck and Kilgortna League. The Cornamuck scheme involves the provision of 1.4 kilometres of realigned single carriageway and is estimated to cost in the region of £6 million. A public consultation into the draft orders and the environmental statement for the scheme has recently been completed and no significant issues were raised. The direction order was made in March 2016, which affords the route alignment planning protection. The scheme at Kilgorton League involves the realignment of approximately two kilometres of single carriageway and it is anticipated it will cost in the region of £7 million. It is hoped that Transport NI will be in a position to identify the preferred alignment for this scheme in 2017. I have tasked my officials to begin drawing up a new suite of transportation plans covering key parts of the road network, including the A32, and this work is ongoing. This will set out a long-term programme of investment and provide an opportunity for all strategic road projects across the north including upgrades to the A32 to be considered for future funding. Rosemary Barton for a supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. 
I'm sure you're aware of this A32, the improvement of the A32 has been ongoing for six, seven, eight years, and it has been held up due to funding. Will, will the Minister consider transferring capital funding to the A32, which was originally set aside for the A5 project, which has been delayed? Uh, very succinctly, no. Here I'm sir, Sean Lynch. My good last can call you, and I hope he has a longer answer for my question. Uh, the Minister talked about addressing the imbalance in the West. Uh, could I ask him when will the draft uh, orders for the Enniskin Bypass be made and when will construction happen? The preferred alignment for the A4 Enniskill and Southern Bypass was announced uh, in June of last year. Work is ongoing preparing the environmental statement and the draft statutory orders. It is anticipated that these will be published in 2017, which may lead to a public inquiry. Subject to successful comp competition of statutory procedures, construction of the bypass will be dependent on budget allocations awarded to my department. Sir Richie McPhillips, I call Richie McPhillips. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for the answer so far. Can you give us an update on the uh, 600,000 that was allocated to addressing flood, flooded roads in key Fermanagh, Fermanagh areas of South Fermanagh? Yeah, uh, there are a number of these. Is, I think it's, there's up to maybe 65 roads now in the Fermanagh area, benefiting from various road maintenance uh, works. Uh, I myself was on site uh, just beside the shower centre uh, last week looking at some of these works that are, that are progressing. Um, but if the member wants to correspond on any particular road, I'm more than happy to do so. I call Sandro Vrend. Mr Deputy Speaker, question number seven, please. The A29 North-South Link Corridor extends from Port Rush through Dungannon and Armagh on to the border with County Louth. The section from Coleraine to Armagh is a trunk road. The current Strategic Road Improvement Programme was established through the Regional Strategic Transportation Network Transport Plan and enhanced by the Investment Delivery Plan for Roads in 2008. This programme includes the A29 Carlin Bridge Realignment Scheme, which my department has delivered at a cost of £5 million and the A29 Cookstown Eastern Distributor Scheme. The A29 Cookstown Eastern Distributor involves construction of approximately four kilometres of new single carriageway from the Dungannon Road roundabout to the south of Cookstown to a proposed new roundabout on the Moneymore Road at the north of the town. The preferred route was announced in 2010. However, development of the significant project has been deferred owing to financial constraints. The upcoming revision of the Regional Strategic Transportation Network Transportation Plan and the development of local transport plans in conjunction with Council's local development plans provide the opportunity to refresh the Strategic Roads Improvement Programme in line with the latest technical evidence, local development pressures and the Programme for Government Priorities of Economic Growth and Social Equality. As Minister, I am keen for my department to progress the A29 Cookstown Eastern Distributor Scheme. I am currently engaging with officials about progression of the scheme's development to the next stage, the publication of the draft statutory orders and the environmental statement. And I think we have time for a quick supplementary. Uh, very quickly, thank you, Minister, for, uh, for detailing that. Um, I wonder, as the Minister, if you could uh, tell us if he has any uh, ideas or if he has a... Sorry. Will the Minister give any consideration to providing such things as overtaking lanes or slow lanes along the A29 so that the business and rural traffic can move and flow nicely together along with commuters because it is a very important road. Thank you. Yes, uh, you know, and whereas many of us jump to the, the very quick conclusion that we want dual carriageways everywhere and we want motorways everywhere, uh, very often two and ones in passing lanes are very, very uh, successful in alleviating congestion, uh, especially in rural settings. Uh, and it's something I'm more than happy to give consideration to going forward. That ends the period for listed questions, and we now move to topical questions. I guess I hear him, sir, Jerry Mullen. I call Jerry Mullen. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, I'm uh, certain, sure, that you're quite aware of the McGillig into Greencastle ferry and the benefits that provides for both for local people in the area and for, for visitors to the area. And, uh, I'm sure that you're aware that there's still a lot of concerns over the long-term stability of the service. Uh, could you outline whether this department uh, has plans to subsidise the service uh, like it does for other ferry services in the north? 
<coughs> well, this is certainly something I'm more than happy to look at. I haven't currently looked at it or it's not sitting with me at the minute. But, you know, we have a number of services uh, the communities uh, are very vital for, if it's the Rathen Island service or, of course, the Strangford Lock service. Uh, and indeed, uh, I think the, the potential to link the, the North Coast in with the, the wide Atlantic Way and talking about the McGilligan Ferry, there's certainly undoubted potential there. So it's certainly an issue that I'm more than happy to correspond with the member on in the future. Supplementary, Jerry Mullen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I just maybe follow that up, Minister, by asking you uh, if you had planned maybe to raise the issue with, at the next North South Ministerial Council meeting? <coughs> Yeah, I haven't planned to do so, but uh, in light of some of the other issues that we'll be discussing, I'm more than happy to do so. There is a transport sexual meeting happens shortly, and I'm more than happy to raise it under any other business. I call Sandra over it. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, given the uh, priorities on strategic projects that the Minister referred to earlier during question time, can the Minister uh, confirm if he's spoken to the Northern Ireland Construction Group uh, to allow them to prepare, to prepare for an infrastructure a stimulus? Yeah, I have spoken to a, a number of stakeholders uh, right across the construction industry, um, and the message coming into post is very clear uh, that the year on budget allocations and one year budgets uh, are, are not sustainable going forward. When we look at large scale infrastructure capital projects, we need to get as much uh, strategic thinking involved, we need to get as much long term thinking involved. Uh, and that's certainly why uh, the forthcoming four-year capital budget will certainly give us, I think, uh, the ability to think a wee bit more strategic when we come to our capital projects. Uh, and I know the industry are very, very uh, content that this is the way forward. Sandra Overend for supplementary. Uh, thank you. And I would urge the Minister to speak uh, directly to the Northern Ireland Construction Group. If he hasn't spoken to them already, I believe he hasn't. Um, but the Minister will know that Mid Ulster is a, is a hub of manufacturing, uh, but also construction employers. And so uh, when I speak for uh, Mid Ulster, I speak for a, not only the construction industry, but also for the infrastructure that we want uh, improved in Mid Ulster. I wonder on that basis, can the Minister give a commitment uh, on the timescale for when Cookstown could expect a bypass being implemented? Yes, certainly, and look, I have an open door, and I will speak to everybody and anybody over the next number of years on how we advance uh, in a very strategic way a number of our infrastructure projects. Uh, I will be turning more specifically to Mid Ulster and the Cookstown Bypass and the adjournment debate this evening. I think it's, it's timely, um, but it's a project I think merits. I, I met with the delegation with uh, Francis Malloy MP and uh, various MLAs uh, to discuss the need for the bypass in Cookstown. In, you know, coming from, a, from an area like South Down, I'm, I'm only too aware that you know, we have a county town in Down Patrick that suffers similar and our manufacturing is calling out uh, for the likes of these distributor roads, which I think can unlock economic growth uh, in areas outside of Belfast. So no, it's a project that I, that I want to, as I've said, to advance over the next number of years uh, and I hope that's something that we can do. Iram, sir, Sinead Bradley, called Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I would like to embrace the succinct yes-no answers that the Minister is issuing today. And I go back to my earlier question because I was left a little bit bewildered. Do you anticipate Narrow Water Bridge being delivered in this mandate? A yes would be nice, but a yes-no answer will suffice. <laughs> uh, as I think I pointed out by your colleague, another one-word answer, of course, is maybe, or there's other one-word answers we could go for. But look, you know, we are constituency colleagues. We know very well of the, the huge significance this project would have unlocking, I think, tourism and economic potential in the North Louth, South Down areas. I'm working actively with people in the South and my government uh, colleagues in the South to advance this project. Officials North and South are sitting down with the, the Narrow Water Bridge stakeholder group this week and next week to advance proposals around this. Um, but we have to take into consideration that the environment that we operate in has changed since the 23rd of June. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't do all in our power to deliver these sort of projects. Um, I am absolutely determined that this is a project we will see delivered. 
Jeanette Bradley for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I, I genuinely welcome that you are determined to see it delivered, as I hope it will be. And, and you rightly point out that the political landscape has changed. But does the minister acknowledge that there is now greater emphasis on this House and the departments within it to actually deliver on this bridge? And I know the Southern Government are firmly on record as being supportive of it, but in the absence of any European funding, the pressures will be added to ourselves. Yes, and it, again, it's not just for this house, but again, of course, it's for our, our counterparts in Dublin. I think the local council has a big role to play here too, which they have done uh, magnificently so far. I think the memorandum of understanding between Louth and Newry and Moran Council and the leadership that uh, chief executives have shown on this in recent years has been very, very important. And just as important as the Narrow Water Bridge project, we of course have large infrastructural plans for the Southern Relief Road, which would be a huge benefit to the town of Newry as well. Um, so no, there are big plans for that part of the world, uh, and I hope I can do all that I can in the years ahead to advance them. Well, Chris Little for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The, the Minister may be aware that in recent years there have been a significant number of roadworks in East Belfast. Transport NI has been working on Belfast Rapid Transit, Rivers Agency on flood alleviation and Power NI on electric, electricity supply upgrades to the Ulster Hospital, um, all of which are extremely important schemes, but the cumulative impact of which has been prolonged congestion and significant uh, disruption to businesses in the area. Um, can the Minister for, uh, account for any strategic planning that went into the timing of those schemes, or would he at least uh, accept the need for a review of that process? Uh, certainly, you know, coming into post since May, I wasn't involved in any of the planning stages, but certainly looking at some of the impact of some of these works to date, um, you know, I believe there's been a considerable increase in those using public transport from East Belfast into the city centre. Um, so I think we need to take, take stock in the round uh, of the impact of these works. I have no doubt that, that works can be uh, troublesome, especially for traders. And as we approach the Christmas period, we obviously need to see as much work being completed in advance of that uh, as possible. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm happy to look at these issues in the round if there are specific needs uh, that we need to address going forward as these works will advance ahead of, as you, you mentioned, the rapid transit in 2018. Uh, I'd be happy if the member wants to correspond on any particular issue. Chris Little for our supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his response. Uh, and certainly, we uh, give our full support for the sustainable transport works that are ongoing. I think the important point, Deputy Speaker, is the cumulative impact of a wide range of different works, uh, and I would indeed welcome the opportunity to correspond with the Minister on that. Can he advise businesses in the area whether indeed there are any opportunities to avail of any type of compensation uh, if there is evidence of significant loss of revenue as a result of disruption to business? This may be an issue the member wants to pick up with the finance minister uh, with regards uh, rates relief or any particular assistance in this. Uh, I think I'm right in saying that in particular circumstances this is an avenue that certain traders haven't down at uh, times. Uh, and certainly, if there's anything in particular that the member wants to raise with me going forward, or any particular works, um, certainly feel free to do so. Here, I'm sir, Alex Maskey. Call Alex Maskey. Can I ask, and call you, can I ask, ask the minister, has the executive taken a position on the water framework directive uh, on the issue of water charges? Yes. Uh, recently, myself and uh, the Agriculture Minister Michelle McElveen presented a joint paper to the executive which received executive support to continue our policy uh, of no domestic water charges uh, for local people. Uh, we have been clear in the executive on continuing our opposition to water charges. Uh, we told the people that we would continue to oppose domestic water charges and we have. Alex Maskey for a supplementary. I can I thank the Minister for that very welcome uh, statement and confirmation of the Executive's position to support people in relation to water charge impositions. Could I ask the Minister how does that actually then reflect on uh, other jurisdictions, and I'm thinking in particular how the Irish Government is dealing with the issue of uh, water charges? I thank the Member for his supplementary. And indeed, I think this all boils down to being straight with the people. If you're opposed to domestic water charges, then you have to stand up 
and where it counts, you have to be there to play the ball. Uh, I am aware that there was a recent Sinn Féin motion in the Dáil to discuss this, and some parties ran away from the responsibility. So outside the House, they can campaign about being against domestic water charges, but when it really matters, they ran away. I am proud to say that this executive uh, continues to oppose domestic water charges. We don't flip-flop on the issue. We say we oppose domestic water charges. We do oppose them, and we continue to oppose them. I call Gary Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I welcome the Minister's confirmation that the A6 and the A5 are in his top five priorities? Uh, can the Minister provide an update on the um, proposed waterside transport hub and the potential refurbishment and um, the, the, the old waterside station when brought back into use? I will be in Derry later this week uh, to talk with officials over the plans for the Derry Transport Hub. It's an exciting project. Uh, negotiations with landowners still are under progress with regards to the specific site, um, but I believe that this is coming to a close, thankfully. Uh, we will be making an announcement of that in due course. Uh, a transport hub in Derry, just as a transport hub for Belfast, I think is the potential to be a real catalyst for economic growth for both regions, and certainly I am excited uh, by the prospect of that. Supplementary, Gary. Uh, can I thank the, the Minister for his uh, response? Can the Minister give any uh, sort of time frame? I appreciate that the, uh, there's issues to do with land and agreements around uh, the, the properties, but can he give any sort of time frame as to when he would foresee such a project being brought uh, into use? Yes, well, you know, certainly without saying anything outside of where negotiations are going with, between landowners and I. I it, I, I certainly don't want to spoil them waters, uh, but I think in the weeks ahead the, the member will be delighted to see uh, the announcement that's made. I think the people of Derry are looking forward to this project. It's been something that's been touted about for some time uh, and something that we're going to you know, say, look forward to deliver. But I'll, I'll, I'll be Derry on Thursday uh, this week to speak with officials, uh, and I'll be very, very keen to hear what progress has been made. I call Stephen Agnew for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I recently wrote to the Minister through an Assembly question in relation to resident parking schemes for Bangor and Hollywood, and he alluded to a number of other pilot schemes that are in process. Can you give me an update on those schemes and their, their timeline? I, I don't have the information at, at hand here for the specific uh, residential schemes that you've mentioned. Uh, we, we are progressing. Uh, with a couple of residential schemes at the minute. I had discussions with officials last week on this. Um, the current policy for this, um, I think, is, uh, has been an issue to date. Um, I have tasked officials now to look at the policy, the policy that came into force in 2007. Um, and we look at the, I think, the demand amongst many areas to have these parking schemes. I think we now need to meet this demand in a number of areas. Uh, but I think we're going to need to have a policy that equips us with the legal arguments. Um, to be able to, um, I think, take cognizance of objections, but certainly move, move ahead in a fair-handed way. Evening you for a supplementary. I thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. I think one of the first Assembly questions I asked um, in 2011 was about resident parking schemes, and the issue then was the hold-up in Belfast. We're five years on. What reassurance can he give my constituents that the hold-up in Belfast won't mean that we never get to North Down? Yeah, well, let me reassure the member that no longer will that be an excuse. You know, when I came in to post, uh, residents in Derry uh, made the exact same complaint that their scheme has been held up because we couldn't get agreement in Belfast. We de decoupled the scheme straight away and was able to launch a pilot uh, in Derry. So certainly uh, I want to judge each case by its own merits and it shouldn't be a case of one particular town being held up because of another town, which is absolutely no resemblance to the case in hand. Call William Humphrey. Can the Minister assure this House of his commitment to the Belfast Transportation Hub? Absolutely. As outlined to your colleague, I think the transport hubs in Derry and Belfast uh, I think are much needed. Uh, if we look at the Europa Bus Centre, a, a transport hub that has stood the test of time, has done a fantastic job, uh, but is now coming to the end of its life, and I think I wouldn't be out of place in saying that. Um, I think TransLink are getting the best the value out of the site that they currently have, but we're coming to a time now where we need a very modern, fit-for-purpose transport hub, and certainly I'm determined to help deliver that in years ahead. Supplementary, William Humphrey, yep. please. I, I'm, I'm pleased to hear the Minister saying that, because the, the Minister will be aware that there's a tremendous amount of investment required in deprived areas like Lower Falls and Sandy Row. 
Will the minister agree to work with ministers across his executive and Belfast City Council to ensure that that investment that he's talked about and other investments in that area will go in to help make the lives of people in those areas much better on a day-to-day -day basis? Yes, absolutely. You know, we're not simply talking here about a piece of infrastructure that will stand with us back to the local communities. Uh, there, you know, it will be open uh, just as much to the rear, uh, to the Grosvenor Road and to the Sandy Road communities. It has to be to be successful going forward. Uh, I was re recently in Rotterdam and the Central Transportation Hub was a centre of community activity and there's no reason why in the new, newly uh, envisaged Linen Quarter and working with the Belfast City Council that we can't have something very similar here in Belfast. Time is now up and we move to questions.